the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be true. And it is not a question of a little occultism or a touch of mysticism, Mr. Devlin. It is vampires. It's a host of damned souls of telepaths. The true God. When he's dead, he can't complain. People assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect, but actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff. You're listening to Paranormal UK Radio. Hello, this is Irene Allen Block from the Paranormal UK radio show, the flagship show of the Paranormal UK radio network. And I'm here with my co-host, my boss, my uh, business partner, my tea boy, Mark Johnson. You forgot my lord. Oh, my lord. Yes. Yes. My lord. (laughs) <laughs> did you like the boss bit I put in there? I did, I did. Yes, well, I'm buttering you up because I want you to uh, <laughs> edit my new book when it comes out. Yeah, whenever it comes out. You've only oh, been working on it for five come, years yes. now. I'm heading for Christmas for this one. Very nice. Yeah, yeah, I've got to get it out of the way, you know. So... I've had a birthday, Mark. Yes, you have. So what are you, 29? One. No, 25. I'm 25. Mm. God, I wish I was. No, I've hit one of the big, big ones. It's one of the big birthdays, and I'm not saying which one. I'm not. (laughs) I know. I know. I know. You know. (laughs) Uh, Oh, my God, I'm a pensioner. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not too far behind. No. no. That's true. Anyway, I had a lovely birthday. It was a really hot day. And my two sons came down from London and they brought down my three youngest grandsons. And the garden was strewn with toys and bikes and God knows what else and slides that they dragged out. But only two things actually got broken, Mark. Well, that's good for a change. Yeah, just two things. A patio chair and the toilet seat. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> and I know that wasn't the little kids that done that. That was the big kids. I know it. So they can they can tell all the fibs they like. It wasn't me. It was him or whatever. I know who done that. I do. Anyway. It's all fixed now, you know. I got Brian out with the glue on the patio chair (laughs) or whatever he was doing, drilling it. And he's mended the toilet seat so I don't slip off it anymore. Um, All fun and games and I had a lovely day and I had a a big, big chocolate cake, birthday cake. And um, I'd been watching this in the the garden centre. I'd seen this... Uh, water feature it's um and i've been looking at it for a year and for a whole year i've been saying i'm gonna have that i want that for my birthday and i got it it's absolutely beautiful nice Mm. yeah so i'm happy i got my i got my water feature and it was hot again yesterday and what did i do i just put my hands in there i thought about putting my feet in there as well but i didn't i thought about shoving gertie dog in there too you know because the water was ice cold it was ice cold coming through it and it was absolutely glorious see you're we actually Oh, yeah, in this part of the Northeast, <clears throat> fall hit about a week early, and we've been down in the low 60s during the day. We've gotten down to the 30s at night. It's cold. It's already hoodie and and bonfire weather. Well, that's happened today. You know, we had this hot spell coming in from Europe, and then something to do with the Gulf Stream bending or something, now it's brought it all over from... Um, 
Iceland or somewhere the cold was. So today it's been absolutely freezing cold out there. It was so hot yesterday, right? That I could have got into a swimming pool, I could have got the bikini out, I could have sunbathed. Today it was coats, woody, um, thick boots, and the central heating on. How silly is all that, huh? I turned this uh, central heating on for the very first time the other day, uh, yesterday, did. just because it was so cold in the house that mm. I couldn't handle it anymore. No. No, it's bad. Anyways, what's been happening with you? Ah, uh, same old, same old. You know, watching uh, my country Rejoice fall completely fall to pieces. Oh, oh, yeah. You've had a few problems out there, haven't you? <sighs> and we're going to continue to have problems <clears throat> until the November. Let's see, what's what's election day? It's November the third. Yeah. Yep. Is that when it is? Yep. Oh. Your first Tuesday of November, and then we have our elections. Oh, I suppose that'll be all over the television here. Oh, God. And, um, but but I'm going to tell you right now, and again, I know we're trying to stay off of politics, uh-huh. but trust me, you, you're, you're going to see, and, and we're a podcast now, so I'm going to say, you're going to see a clusterfuck beyond your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> because even though the election is that day, they're already saying that they're not going to try to call the race. Uh, they they want to wait for all these mail-in ballots. They're going to try to drag this shit out for weeks. You thought the 2000 election with George Bush and those ballots in Florida and hanging chads was bad? This one is already going to be a nightmare because... The uh, the left in this country, are, they want power back so bad, they're doing everything they can to try to steal it. Oh, now you know what's happened, don't you? We just had thousands and thousands of people switch off. <laughs> you know what? I'm... Do you know what we should do, Mark? We should do a rant. We need to do another rant show. Here, here's keep the, saying this. Here's the problem with doing the rant. I, I, I don't want to do an angry rant. I would, I wish... No, we don't. We just get, get out what's bothering us, don't we? But, you know, we just put it out there. You know what? I can, I could do that, but I could also do it much simpler. It's just like, you know what, people? Knock it the hell off and let's all get along. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, the, keep it's, social distancing. It's it's the violence. It's the um, the the media corruption. The the lying. The the hysteria. Yeah, the fear mongering. Right. Hasn't the world always been like this, Mark? Yes, but it has gotten so much worse these last few years. And you know, all the blame is going in one direction, but yet it's really the people pointing in that direction that are causing it. So. Notice I didn't say well, any names. Yeah, well, we can only wait and see what happens in the election. But, you know, I still think we need to do a rant show because there are so many things going on in this world that we can discuss. Yeah. You know? You don't have to lose your temper. I know you lose your temper with me sometimes, but yeah. you don't have to lose your temper to do a discussion on what's going on in the world. Right. All the pitfalls. And I think... We'll leave it. We'll leave it and see whether people want to. If any, listen, if people want us to do a rant and a, a, um, which is a discussion show, let us know at info i n f o at p a u k radio dot com. Sure. Uh, and while we're on the email address, Mark. What are we looking for? Well, we are certainly looking for more shows to add to the network, especially if uh, shows based out of the UK. So Mm -hmm. anyone uh, in the UK who uh, has a paranormal theme show and you're looking for a network, we'd uh, definitely like to talk to you. Well, we're a station, aren't we now? We're station status, so that's pretty good. So we would like to talk to you. And again, contact us at info, I-N-F-O, at P-A-U-K radio dot com, all lowercase. There you go. go. That's it. Right, so where are we now? I think it's time to introduce our guest. Yeah, that'd be good, wouldn't it? Yep. 
So who mm-hmm. who wants to do the um, the honors? Go on then. Oh, so you're gonna leave it to me, huh? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, you do it better than me. Well, we want to welcome back to the show uh, Craig Bryant. Now, Craig has been on the show several times. He's the author of his book, The Shadow Man of Accrington, Haunting Stories of the Paranormal and the Unexplained in Lancashire. So, uh, Craig, welcome back to the program. Hi, thanks for having me back on again. Hello, Craig. And this time it's going to be a bit different, isn't it? Because not are you not only are you going to talk about ghosties, you're also going to be talk about UFOs and ley lines. Uh, yes, indeed, it's um, it's some research that I've been doing since uh, mm. since we last spoke. Okay, well, Mark is a little bit better with the UFO side than I am, so... <laughs> I, I'm better with UFOs. She's better with the ley lines aspect, because there's a lot about ley lines I still don't know a lot about. So, you know what, Craig? We're going to put this in your ball court and let you run with it. Uh, which would you like to start off with first? Well, we can we can start off with the um, with with the ley lines and then go on to the UFOs because <clears throat> they are sort of uh, connected in a way, or or at least I think they're connected anyway from the okay. research. Mm-hmm. So um, so yeah, we 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 can talk about the um, the ley lines. Um, I don't know whether you remember, but we we did speak um, a while ago. We did a um, a podcast about the um, the Pendle witches. Yes, um, and of course, um, if if people didn't didn't hear that, then the area of of, of England that I live in is up in the northwest, um, sort of northwest of of Manchester and um, east from from Liverpool. So that that sort of area, it's called um, the county of Lancashire. The area that I live in is called the Ribble Valley, um, and it is uh, extremely close to Pendle Hill. So Pendle Hill, as as we well know, is synonymous with um, with the Pendle Witch Trials of 1612. But the whole area um, around Pendle, and in fact around the whole of of the, the eastern part of Lancashire, which is where I, I live and I grew up, um, and over towards the west coast um, of Lancashire, so um, the towns of Blackpool, for instance, and Preston. Um, and up to an area called Morecambe Bay, um, there is also um, very high instances of, of certainly UFO sightings over on the West Coast, but it's also an area of sort of high paranormality as well. So I started having a look to see why the area of Pendle and Pendle Hill in particular was um, sort of a magnet for... Uh, UFO activity in particular, because <clears throat> the more research that I did um, looking into um, UFO sightings in the area, the more I found that, that there were just more and more coming to light. And in fact, I'd had a, a sighting um, myself back in uh, early December 2018. And it was that that sort of um, sparked this interest in, well, if I've seen something strange, then, then you know, probably other people have in the area as well. And the more people I spoke to, the more I realised that, that this is an area not only of, of high paranormality and, 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 you know, really great ghost stories, um, yeah. but also really great UFO uh, activity as well. And so I discovered that I started looking into ley lines, and ley lines was something which um, I wasn't particularly familiar with. But I remember listening to an interview um, from a lady called uh, Jenny Randalls, and yeah. I don't know. I, yeah, I don't. I, you, you obviously know Jenny's work. Um, yeah, she's Je- been on Je- a couple of air shows, I think. Right. Well, yeah, Jenny's very, very well respected. Um, fascinating. Uh, insights into into what she thinks um, sort of caused these areas of, of of UFO activity in particular, and in fact, Jenny um, did a, a lot of research into the um, very famous UFO case of, of Alan Godfrey um, from Hebden Bridge, which is not too far from here. It's in the county of West Yorkshire, but because we're quite close to county lines, in yeah. effect, it's it's not very far. Um, as the crow flies it's probably 15 20 miles um and of course 
the the nearby town of Todmorden has, has also had um, quite a lot of, of UFO activity over the years, and that's that again is 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 a hot is a local hotspot for UFO activities, and in fact um, that was the the centre of, of the, the Alan Godfrey case because that was if anybody's familiar with, with Alan Godfrey's story, PC Alan Godfrey's story, he was um, uh, sort of taken by um, aliens, he was abducted but prior to his um, experience he had been involved in an investigation into a very very strange um, incident where uh, the body of a man called uh, Adamski had been found in uh, in Todmorden, and I'm not going too much into that at, at this particular time. But it was a very strange um, murder inquiry, and there was a lot of elements that that would seem to suggest that the the uh, the gentleman involved, uh, uh, Adamski, had in fact been very possibly um, had dealings with with UFOs and extraterrestrials which had led to led to his death so that whole area is is you know a real hotbed of activity yeah when i started looking at, at, at <clears throat> ley lines there was there was two particular lines that i discovered which actually cross um very very close to pendle hill and in fact um when I looked at, at, at maps and, and ordnance survey maps, they were almost crossing directly across um, the summit of the hill. They were literally about a quarter of a mile to the uh, northwest of, of the summit of Pendle Hill. So, you know, geologically, they were very close. And these two ley lines, the one which ran from north to south, um, ran from a place called Castle Rig Stone Circle, which is in uh, Cumbria. I'm not, I yeah. don't know whether you're yeah, familiar with that. Um, no, I've and, never been there, but... OK, well, it's it's sort of... Um, it's, it's it's in the Lake District, which is a, um, a oh. national park in, in, in our country. Um, it's an area of, of outstanding natural beauty. It's all mountains and, and lakes and everything else. Um, but it's actually uh, referred to as um, the Stonehenge of the North, so yeah. it's a it's a stone circle which is dated at roughly about the same sort of um, age as Stonehenge, and the ley line that that starts there runs from roughly in the north to south direction down to the south coast of of England. Mm-hmm. Um, but the one that intersects it is a is a lot more interesting. This runs from um, west to east or east to west um, from Preston which is a a town on the west coast of Lancashire. And it it, it intersects and goes all the way up to the uh, east coast, uh, up near um, the seaside town of Whitby. And the interesting thing about that area is that that in itself is an area of of very high UFO activity. Um, And if anybody has heard of of a guy by the name of Paul Sinclair... We know Paul Sinclair, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, Paul Mm. obviously does a lot of... um, He's very... yeah, yeah. Yeah, he does a lot of UFO investigations mm. and and cryptozoology and um, you know the, um, you know animal mutilations and, yeah, and those sort true. of investigations. So, so these this particular ley line, I found that really interesting, especially with the one that runs west to east. Um, mm. The fact that the fact that it actually um, sort of intersects up in that area of the northeast where where. You know, Paul is very, very active, and it crosses the North Yorkshire Moors very close to, to where he does a lot of his uh, investigations. But there are also on on that particular line there are two quite, and and again I find this quite interesting. There are two quite large um, RAF bases. Now, one of them is based up in in North Yorkshire, um, and that's uh, called Filingdales. And Filingdales is um, it's it's a, a, a nuclear tracking facility, um, mm-hmm. absolutely top secret. Um, you can actually see it when you're driving over the moors. I've been past it a few times my, uh, myself, 
but it, it is just like a huge concrete structure and there are no windows there doesn't seem to be any way in or any way out there's no roads towards it it is just literally a huge concrete structure which is in the middle of the the north yorkshire moors <clears throat> and it's obviously you know it's very high up so it's overlooking the north sea and of course looking out towards uh russia and and what was the old soviet union and that's that's why it was built up there but that, that actually sits very close to this ley line and a little bit further west um is is another raf base and again this is another raf tracking base um and this is called raf men with hill and again and that's a very when- famous one it is. When you drive past that one, the, the radar facilities, um, mm. they look like huge um, footballs or, or yeah. golf golf that's balls, right. in fact. Um, and so, again, that's on, on the same line. And that is, is actually, again, as the crow flies, not that far away from from where I'm based um, here in, in Lancashire. Mm. So I found that quite interesting. And, and so the... Well, Before before you go any further, Craig, Mm. right, some people may not know what a ley line is. You know, it's... um, So do you want to explain exactly what a ley line is? I know that there is... uh, They seem to run from prehistoric or whatever structures like Stonehenge and one thing or another, and there's cathedrals built on them. Yeah. And also that they were first... uh, in 1921, this uh, archaeologist, Alfred Watkins, made the discovery and he started putting the supernatural side to it. Mm. Well, yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's explained it much mm. better than, than, than I could, Irene. It's, it's, it's an energy line. Yeah, the lines of energy. And, and the Earth interesting energies. thing, going, yeah, going back to, what, to what, what I was talking about before with, with Jenny's work... Um, Jenny's looked at these areas of, of, of UFO activity and it would seem that, that there is something within the geology of, of the area um, which seems to almost act as a, as a sort of magnetic pull to, to concentrate um, a, a lot of UFO activity as well as, as well as paranormal activity. I don't think that you can, you can separate the two, to be quite honest with you. Um, but the interesting thing about, about Pendle Hill is that you know, you talk about um, ancient burial sites and and, and you yeah. know ancient stone circles. Um, there's there's an Iron Age Iron Age burial site uh, which was discovered on the the top of Pendle Hill, um, and it's it's nearly two thousand feet above sea level, and it's right on the plateau on the top of the hill. Now, you know, it, anybody who's ever who's ever walked up Pendle Hill, even on a uh, a glorious sunny summer's day, which we don't get many of them in Lancashire. But you know, even even on a, a beautiful day, which when you get to the top of the hill, the you know the views, the three hundred and sixty degree views are just absolutely spectacular. I don't think, and I've been I've been all over the world. I don't think there's anywhere that that is quite as magical and as and as beautiful as as the countryside that I'm very fortunate to live in. But you have to ask the question. Well, you know. If you were if you were Iron Age man um, and you were living down in the in the valleys, um, you were living down near the river because of the River Ribble, which runs through this area, which is why it's a very yeah. sort of fertile floodplain. If you were Iron Age man and you were living down down by the down by the river, why would you take a body two thousand feet up the side of what is? a very very steep hill it's almost a mountain um and i know it's very steep because i've walked it several times and it is it is quite quite arduous why would you take a um a body all the way up there 2000 feet up up a almost a mountain to to bury it on a on a plateau so when they, you, obviously, when... they obviously see it as sacred then there was obviously because iron, iron yeah. age iron age settlements were always down near close to rivers weren't they mm, exactly Exactly. So, you know, why why would you do that? Why, there, there was obviously something, there was something special about the hill. There was something uh, important enough about the person that they buried up there um, in order to, to make that journey up there and, and, and carry out that burial. So when you put all the pieces together and the fact that the geology of the hill as well and, you know, 
I must admit to not being a geologist, um, but I have sort of looked things up on on you know various different um, uh, websites about the area and everything else. And and the geology of it is 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 quite interesting. It's it's millstone grit, which is which is very hard substance. Um, but all around the area, if for, for you know hundreds of square miles around it, is all limestone. So mm. that tends to to wear down a lot quicker, which is why the hill is is uh, as it is because it's harder rock. So obviously, again, when you're looking at, at you know the theories that that. Jenny has and, and and that many other people have. Um, there may well be some sort of magnetic energy. There could be some energies running along these ley lines, and the fact that they cross um, so close to the hill, so close to the summit, you know, where we have this this Iron Age burial, it all it all seems to suggest that there is something very special about the area. And of course, then the number of, of UFO sightings that have been over the years in this area. Um, that's, would that's, seem, your, would that's your field, Mark. <laughs> yeah, would seem would seem to suggest that that's the case. And it, and it's not just around here as well. I mean, the whole of Lancashire. You know, I mean these these areas of energy, I think, are not not just um, you know sort of uh, centred on any particular one area. They do they do cover quite large areas. Hmm. So. Well, yeah, there, Mark. Yeah. Well, one one of the questions I have is in regards to ley lines. Mm-hmm. You, you talk about where ley lines run. Where do we? And again, I'm talking as someone who knows practically nothing about ley lines, other than the fact that they are an energy grid crisscrossing the planet. But how are they detected, and how do people find them and make maps of them? That's the one thing I don't understand. They when they claim like. Every major Neolithic structure uh, from the pyramids to, you know, Tiwanaku in Mexico and, to, to, you know, all these other places are supposedly all built on ley lines. But how do we know there are ley lines there? Is, is that something you can explain? I, I've got a little explanation for that, but it's a silly one. <laughs> but you, no, please, you, please, please do. <laughs> well, I had a fella come out here once because uh, they said a lot of the activity in this house was down to ley lines. And this fella went round the whole of this property mapping exactly where these ley lines were. And uh, he was dousing for them, literally dousing. And then he drew me a map, but I've lost it. And then I had this other couple come out <laughs> and uh, they said that it came down through uh, one of the big manor, old manor houses down to the border of Carmarthen where the border stone marks the beginning of Carmarthen. And uh, they'd done something, it told me to stand on it, done something or they were saying saying things and one thing or another. I can't remember what they were saying, but I tell you what, when they started, I felt a vibration go up through my legs. Hmm. So, and another thing they say, another thing is one th- people will say to you, if you're having trouble with the ley line, put a crystal on it. It turns the ley line another way. You know, I don't believe this, but or put a rock on it and it will hit the rock and go off in a different direction. I had all this sort of thing when I first came to this house because of the amount of activity in this house. And I just uh, resigned to the fact, well, where the house is haunted. So, you know, <laughs> bugger the ley line. But how do the professionals, like Mark said, how do they map them? How do they find out where they are? Well, I I think that, you know, it, it's very similar with, with paranormal activity. I think that, that some people are more susceptible to be able to pick mm. up these, these lines of energy um, in the same way that some people are more susceptible to pick up um, on paranormal activity. Um, and, you know... With regards to ley lines, it's. I mean, I, I was I was never a believer, and I am still somewhat sceptical, even though I have maps in front of me, you know, well 
um, well-respected maps of, of people. Well, that have... I, be- I believe they do exist. I it's believe they the exist. It's just the way that this lot mm. were trying to find them wasn't really convincing to me. You no, know? Al- al- although you, you, you have to ask the question. I mean, I've seen, I've seen people dousing for water. Yeah. And they're basically they're basically walking along with a core tanger in each hand, and then all of a sudden these core tangers start spinning round like tops, and there is no explanation as as to why they do that. It's it's the it's the old question, isn't it, about spoon bending? You know how how does somebody bend a spoon? Um, you know, they Uri, 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 Uri Geller was was the guy was the guy that could just you know touch a spoon with his with his forefinger and his thumb, and it, it will bend all over the place. Yeah. Um, and so, a lot of it, I, in, in my opinion, is certainly to do with um, with natural magnetic energy. I think it's got a lot to do with geology. Um, mm. I, you know, I think it's. I think a lot of it we still don't understand. I think there are some people that are more tuned into it than others. I mean, I'm certainly. Um, I like to think that I'm, I'm tuned in a little bit to the paranormal side of things, um, but it's like tuning an old um, AM FM radio. You know, you yeah. have to just dial into the frequency just right in order to be able to pick up the um, the energy or the vibrations or the feelings. And sometimes it is just a feeling. I mean, you know, I, I don't know whether you've ever walked into an old building or even a new building. Oh, uh, yeah, and you get and, 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 and felt something and thought, this, mm. you know, there's something here. I don't know what it is, but I can feel something. And I... I certainly did that um, when I was doing research for for the book uh, that I wrote uh, last year. That's that's um, that's still available. And you know, I went into to certain places, and and I immediately had a feeling that that there was something there, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And I think that that maybe some people are the same with. Um, oh, I be- with I earth believe energy that. or you know magnetic yeah. energy, that sort of thing. No, I definitely believe in ley lines. I believe in earth energy, but. Uh, you know, so it's just the way some people go about it that doesn't convince me uh, that they are actually picking. This fella actually turned around and said that there was a box buried in the garden. Do you know, I've had my husband dig up every part of that garden for that box. Still haven't found it. <laughs> I've got a nice, nice garden now. <laughs> it's not, not nicely dug over. <laughs> <laughs> nicely dug over, yeah. And uh, another friend of mine that used to work for me... Um, she is. She came from America. Um, oh, what is that? Hurricane Alley that goes right through Kansas and all that place, Mark. Tornado Alley. Tornado Alley. Yeah, she lived. She lived somewhere along there, and she always knew when something there was going to be a disaster because. She got all this paranormal activity, and she says that these things were following a ley line. This paranormal activity was following this ley line. And, of course, she picked up on this stuff, and she could tell me when there was going to be a tornado coming, when there was going to be an earthquake, everything, any any disaster whatsoever, she was able to tell me, and she was always right. Because she picked up on this stuff a couple of days before the event would happen or a couple of weeks before the event would happen, and she would tell me exactly when it was going to be. So she was definitely in tune with it. But, uh, you know, I've done stuff. I've done remote views and things where I've seen things travelling along a line, a straight line, like a ley line. So I do believe they exist. I know energy lines exist. It's just that I think it's a simpler way of picking up on them if you're a psychic than the ways that have been shown to me. Well, then if, you know, you're, I don't, if, you're, if you're an ordinary person like me. Well, these ley lines are very deep into the earth, right? And uh, putting, a, putting a boulder or a little rock on top, it's not going to shift the ley line. It's just going to go straight through it. If it can go through a house, it can go through a little stone that's put on it. You know, that doesn't make sense to me. And I know that if there is something that comes through this house, because a lot of the weird activity in this house, especially these kind of what I call astral-type creatures, not the, not my hauntings, but other things that we see in this house, they always follow a line through the house. Always, whenever they're seen. So, you know... 
I do I do thoroughly believe it. But and do you believe there's a connection with the UFOs and these ley lines? I can't I can see that. I can really see that. Yeah, I, 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 it's it's an interesting theory, and it's a theory that, that I've I've yeah. come across from from other people as well. That the the areas where, where the ley lines cross um, are are areas of, of particular high energy. Now, yeah. whether this is this is magnetic energy or, or some other electrical energy or, or some other sorts of energy, um, it's difficult to ascertain. But but there certainly seem to be um, areas where there are uh, concentrations of, of UFOs uh, being sighted, and 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 it's not just necessarily. Um, Sort of located to a small area where these these ley lines cross. They tend to be it tends to be in a much wider arc. So you know, so sort of quite a quite a large area uh, radiating out from from where they cross, which would suggest that, that there is you know there could well be a very um, powerful source of energy there, which is which is bringing them in. Yeah. So Mark, you know that case that you worked on that had that. Um, in New Jersey mm-hmm. at that time, with these earth energies. Well, I you there was ley line there. There, it possibly, because I know of three or four locations, even one right up here near me, actually two up here near where I currently live, uh, and where I've lived before where there was high amounts of paranormal activity, and again, not just in a house, but within a neighborhood. And I there are several i i just consider them spots of high energy or high activity and uh you know it, not knowing much about ley lines myself it's quite possible yes there's probably ley lines crossing through these areas it's a possibility but i yeah. also feel like there's there are things that are very much attached to the land whether they're you know nature types of spirits or interdimensionals or portals or whatnot i don't know all i know is that they're very high concentrated areas of high strangeness so it's interesting you should say that mark because as i, as I said at the, at the beginning of, of, of the chat where i live is, is actually quite close to pendle hill we are probably about a quarter of a mile away and the the confluence of these two ley lines i would put somewhere between uh, the village that i live in and pendle hill itself um and in fact there's a there's a main arterial road a main a road as we call them over here which sort of um, intersects uh, the village and and Pendle Hill itself, and and I actually think that it, it they they cross somewhere near this this main road, but the 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 book that I wrote was was you know mainly about paranormal experiences, um, ones that I had I'd, I'd had myself and then friends and and family and and so on, um, but. The village that I live in is actually relatively small. It's only got a population of about a thousand people, and yet I have got half a dozen at least stories that I've I've uh, been told and I've I've investigated over the last six months, really since we sort of went into uh, into lockdown. Um, about some, there are some absolutely amazing stories that I've picked up just in this area, just in this small area alone. And I have to believe that that has got something to do. I can't believe that that you know a village this size has got such um, a high number of of you know ghostly paranormal uh, <clears throat> things that have happened. Um, it has to be. There has to be something to do with these lines of energy. It, it can't just be a coincidence. And in fact, one of them is an absolute. And I'd, I'd like to chat about this later if we can. It's an absolute classic time slip type um, incident. And and again, you know, there there must be some sort of energy involved, which is which is causing, as as, as you just described it, a portal um, to open up. Well, if they can open up all along these ley lines, and again, everything from from paranormal ghostly activity to UFO activity to other aspects of high strangeness, even 
crypto crypto sightings, you know, all seem to intersect. And the fact that almost every major Neolithic site from Stonehenge to the pyramids uh, to Pumapunku to um, Angkor Wat are all built along these ley lines. And and in conjunction with um, the stars as well, there's there's a lot of astrological uh, associations with most of these sites as well. So I mean, it's either um, our our distant ancestors could could pick up on these lines of energy, um, for, you know, for, for for some reason uh, they could identify them, and, and and over time we've lost that ability to do so, or maybe they had some help to build these particular structures in these particular places because um, there were areas where where there was. Um, high amounts of energy, and, and you know they were they were sat on these ley lines. Maybe they, they had help. Who knows? As Giorgio Sukalos says, I'm not saying it was aliens, but it was aliens. <laughs> um, actually, you know my my personal opinion, which has changed a lot during the years, and do I believe in so called quote unquote ancient aliens, or that we've been visited, you know, by extraterrestrial. Um, beings for thousands if not hundreds of thousands of years absolutely at the same time uh, I also feel that we have had more advanced human civilizations it's not just that the the one theory that 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 most ancient alien theorists seem to have is, yeah, we are a primitive people. The aliens showed up, either they genetically engineered us or, you know, they came and taught us simple cavemen how to do, how to make fire, how to farm, how to do all this stuff and how to build these big civilizations. And yet, you know, so it's, so again, it's going from a very linear path and, I personally feel through a lot of the research, through a lot of what I've picked up over the years, that while they may have been visiting us, we had more highly advanced human civilizations on this planet that go back tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. And we had we we had an event happen about twelve thousand six hundred years ago. You could call it the Great Flood. You could call it the um, solar system-wide catastrophe. But something happened that pretty much kind of pushed a reset button for humankind. And we suddenly lost. You'll notice that, um, and th there's a researcher, his name's Brian Forrester. We've had him on the program. He's appeared on Ancient Aliens, but he, he lives in Cusco, Peru, and he specializes in studying megalithic structures. And the one thing he's always shown is that a lot of these older, oldest structures are so much more highly advanced technologically, we could not reproduce them today, and yet... As the years progressed and as we start getting more towards modern times, the building techniques get poorer and poorer until it's basically just piling rocks on top of each other. The, we lost those skills, the same skills that happened in ancient Egypt. You know, in ancient Egypt, they built all of these colossal, everything from the pyramids, all these colossal buildings. And yet there was a period of time when that stopped and no more were built. And uh, unless you're building, you know, uh, mud and mud huts or mud and clay huts, you know, we've we've lost technology. Uh, and the, the and Romans. You, part. What's that? The Romans. Well, the Romans. Underground heating and baths and the Greeks, the Romans. Mm. Uh, look at the uh, what's the, the that um, site in Baalbek, Lebanon, uh, the the big temple structure there it's it's incredible and we can't we could barely build something like that with modern tools i personally love puma punku in uh, bolivia which is at yeah. 14,000 feet first of all the h blocks that are laser precision cut with small drill holes in andesite granite which is the hardest thing in the world copper tools could not 
barely scratch these things. And yet these blocks look like they came out of a mold. And, you know, again, that technology, tens of thousands of years old. Yeah. And um, but then in even the Aztec Empire over time, you know, they started to, the Aztecs came later. You know, they they attribute some of these great monuments and some of these pyramids and whatever to the Aztecs when really they were built by older civilizations. You ask the Aztecs, Do you, did you guys build these? Come, no, we don't know who did. We came later. So uh, it, it is true. There, there's got to be something in it. I'm sorry, Craig. That was one of my rants. Yeah, I, no, I get, no, no, I get no. Going it's, and... it's a fascinating subject, and 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 I'll hold my hand up. I'm I'm no, I am no expert. I'm I'm a complete you know layman when it comes to, no joke intended. I'm a complete layman when it comes to um, ancient alien uh, theorists. Uh, but it's fascinating, uh, and, you know. It, it really is a fascinating subject. And of course, it it begs the question, you know, going back to the Romans, what have the Romans ever done for us? <laughs> <laughs> Brought peace. But, um, yeah, I got a bath because of him. <laughs> <laughs> and on the floor here. The aqueduct. And, uh, exa- exactly. The aqueduct. Yeah. Hmm? The aqueducts. The aqueducts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we could go into a complete monologue, couldn't we, on that? And, <laughs> <laughs> and the roads. Don't forget the roads. Oh, yeah, the roads go without yeah, saying, don't the they? Roads. Yeah. And the yeah. wine. Don't forget the wine. Oh, yeah. 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 Not the wine, yeah. <laughs> yeah Sanitation. Education. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh god one of my favorite films of all time oh absolutely brilliant <laughs> yeah. and anyway and, so where were we ufos so yeah ufos so um yeah i mean just just sort of um talking about the area immediately around here so the pendle hill area there's been there's, a hell of a lot of ufos around there haven't there there has um i saw one back in december <clears throat> Which which was a very strange, um, very strange sighting. Um, I mean, briefly, it was it was um, it was early December, so um, it had it had gone dark very early. It was um, it was a, a a very clear, crisp evening, uh, about half past six in the evening. Uh, we just finished sitting down to dinner, and I was stood outside in in the garden, looking up at the looking up at the stars. Um, we don't have a lot of light pollution around here because it's quite sort of rural. In fact, there's just one uh, street lamp, um, sort of over uh, away the back of the house. Um, so when I look up, it's it's very dark, and I was looking up over towards Pendle Hill because I, w- I could just see the silhouette of it against uh, against the sky. And I noticed that there was there was a, a point of light which initially looked like a star, and it was moving from from where I was uh, from where I was stood from right to left, so from west to east. Uh, but it was moving quite quickly, and the first thing I thought was that maybe it was a, a shooting star, but it, it didn't act like a shooting star. It, it was visible for too long. Um, and then the second thing I thought was it was the International Space Station. So I shouted back through the, the door to um, to Sarah, my wife, who was uh, in the front of the house, um, you know, come and have a look at this. I think it's the International Space Station. Um, and I sort of heard a bit of grumbling because I think she was watching something on TV. Anyway, the next thing she shouted back to me, no, it's not. I've just checked on, on Google. And the International Space Station at that particular moment in time was actually over the Southern Hemisphere. It was nowhere near the Northern Hemisphere, so it couldn't have been the ISS. Anyway, as as we were having this conversation, this this point of light, which had been travelling in a, in a perfectly straight uh, line from from west to east suddenly stopped and it it, it it started to rotate in a in a clockwise direction and it was a very very tight um, circular movement and in fact the 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 best way that I can describe it was um, like a firework like a Catherine wheel spinning mm. round really really quickly and then all of a sudden it shot upwards um, for about a, about a second and then it stopped and it came back down to its original position and then started moving very slowly back westward the way that it had, it had originally come 
And this went on for probably 45 seconds to maybe a minute. And I, I watched this, this thing and I thought, what on earth is that? Because that is not acting like anything uh, man-made. It's not an aircraft. Um, it's not a. It's not even a drone. Because a, it was pitch black, and b, if it was a drone, it was acting in a very, very strange uh, fashion. And as as I was sort of going through all these possibilities of of, of what on earth this this point of light was, um, it suddenly stopped. And it just shot off up into the sky and disappeared. But it, it shot off so quickly. I mean, it's your classic um, sort of UFO sighting where people, you know, lots of people have, have reported seeing strange lights hovering in the sky or moving very slowly through the sky and then suddenly accelerating off at speed um, that is, is almost impossible to uh, to explain how anything man-made could, yeah. could accelerate at that, that sort of speed. So I stood there for, for about five or ten minutes and I thought, what on earth was that? That is really, really strange. And then, anyway, the following day, this is this is the, the interesting bit about it. The following day, um, th- it was all over the news, the national news in this country, um, and all over the the national newspapers, that um, there have been two RAF jets have been scrambled from uh, RAS Lossiemouth, which is obviously up in Scotland. So it's you know it's a couple of hundred miles north of here. Um, but but they'd been scrambled um, early in in the evening, Sunday evening, which is when I saw this object, um, because there had been a sighting of um, an unidentified uh, aircraft or, or object in the air, which was heading out from um, an easterly direction. Sorry, from a westerly direction to an easterly direction. So in other words, from inland. Going yeah. out over the north north coast of, of England, um, and heading out over the North Sea, um, and of course, if it's an unidentified object, the first thing that the RAF, or when it's picked up on radio, uh, radar, I think that it's it's some sort of Russian um, aircraft that's um, that's flying too close to to British airspace, um, and so this this particular object that I saw. When it shot off at speed, it was heading out eastwards and, and disappeared over the horizon. Um, and as I say, you know, the the RAF was scrambled because there was there was an object seen heading out from from land yeah. out over the the coast and heading out towards the North Sea um, at speed, and and they couldn't explain what it was. They they thought it was some sort of well, they uh, must have, they must have picked it up on radar then. So they picked it up on radar. But it was a big, it was a big enough story to to hit both the national news um, and all the national newspapers. You know, less than twenty four hours after it had happened. So mm. whether the two, whether the two were linked, um, I don't know. But I certainly certainly know that what I saw was a was a very strange object, and it behaved in a in a very strange way. And in fact, over the years, you know, even going back. Um, sort of less than 10 years there's been you know at least half a dozen sightings of, of various different objects over... do you know something craig i often wonder whether when they do scramble the jets up because there's a, a unidentified flying object up in the sky when they do scramble the jets whether they when they report them as russians or another country flying too close to air airspace or flying into air airspace whether that's actually true or not whether they're just saying that to cover up the fact that they you know it was a ufo and I, I think there's there's probably a lot of um a lot of mileage in, in what you say there Ari. i think you're probably yeah, right you know, yeah definitely <laughs> yeah. um but but yeah, there's there's been um, there's been a number of sightings. Um, you know, they've they've ranged from. I mean, one of them in in uh, 2015, um, it was reported to to the um, to the police, uh, various different police forces in this area. Um, uh, that there was a um, a large glowing ball which was hovering. Uh, about a thousand fifteen hundred feet above the summit of the hill, and it was it was hovering there for for about two to three hours, 
and yeah. there were there were there were dozens and dozens and dozens of people who who rang the you know their local police station. So um, the opposite side of the hill to where we are is the town of Burnley. Burnley police station received dozens of phone calls. Um, the uh, the local town to where we are, which is called Clitheroe, there was a police station there that's now closed down. But at the time, uh, it was open. They received dozens and dozens of phone calls, and and they all described exactly the same thing. So there were people living in the villages and towns all around the hill that mm. were looking at it from different angles, and they were all seeing the same thing. And they all reported that <coughs> this this glowing um, bluish white object which was seen hovering suddenly again as I said with the one that I saw literally just accelerated and shot up and disappeared from sight um, at a speed that that you could not explain um, was possible for for a man-made object Um, Mm. and and, and there's been several sightings like that you know they've they've been described as as pulsing uh, pulsing balls of light to to pulsing balls of light with, with sort of disco lights around the bottom of them um and and, and yeah they've 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 been they've been quite regular really certainly over the last uh 10 15 years there's, there seems to be any number of of reports and sightings some of them are, are, are dismissed as as just individuals who've seen something that they can't explain sometimes they're dismissed as you know things like planets, for instance, like the planet Jupiter, for instance, has been has been blamed for some of the sightings. Um, but you know there are too many similar descriptions um, for me well, to believe are, yeah, that, that they're just random. You know. Yeah, they come in from all around the world, and they're all basically based on the same sort of descriptions. And Mark actually saw one or oh, some more than one as he was driving along the road. Can you mark? A few years ago, yeah. Um, yeah. Th- th- I, my wife and I were driving to dinner, and we saw uh, what looked like about 15 to 20 of these orangish balls of light traveling in formation, uh, flying parallel to us, going the opposite way. And unfortunately, I was on a busy road. I couldn't pull over or pull out a camera to film it, but from... What I could tell, uh, it was just dusk. They appeared to be about 300 feet off the ground, maybe uh, two or 300 feet. And they were spread out in a long line, uh, maybe a couple hundred yards long. And they'd be like in ones and twos, maybe three across, whatever. But they were all flying. Some of them were like flying around each other, swirling around. Others were more stationary. And at first I thought it was a swarm of drones. But what struck me was they were flying in a straight path. Uh, coming from the um, southwest, going northeast, about 40, 50 miles an hour. And uh, I rolled down my windows. I couldn't hear the buzzing like drones give off. And uh, they just flew by. And I watched them for a few minutes before they disappeared. And, they, you know, for drones to go be traveling a few miles, you know, most drones only have about a 20-minute flight time. So and these things were coming from a you know from a far away. I watched them as they passed and continued to go past to the to the northeast, and uh, that's the only thing that throws me off. The thinking they weren't drones. I mean, what 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 are I live in the in the farmland up here in New Jersey. There's no reason there should be drones. Now there is a um, an army national guard arsenal nearby here picatinny arsenal which there's always been rumors that they do some weird things out of there and my my wife seems to think that they came from picatinny i'm not going to sit here and say that they were classic ufos spaceships i have no idea what they were and i talked to several friends who were pilots uh who, who are familiar with aviation and i based on my description they have no idea what it was either so it's truly it was, they were UFOs in that I couldn't identify them and I have no idea what it is. Mm-hmm. Why would drones be flying in formation like that, though? It's 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 weird, isn't it? <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, there, there's Strange. a lot about it that didn't make sense, and mm. uh, I know a couple of other people who saw the, saw it as well. So, uh, but it's only been seen the one time. I haven't seen him around here since. Strange, very strange. Right, Gustis. Well, can I can I just um, tell you a, a a really interesting UFO story? There's there's a couple there's a couple actually that I came across, but I'll 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 keep it to the um, to the stranger of the two. Although, if there's time, um, it will be quite nice just to mention the other one as well. Um, there's a place called uh, Winter Hill. And, and Winter Hill is um, an area of, of moorland, quite elevated, quite high moorland, um, which is over near um, the northwestern part of Greater Manchester, near a, a town called Bolton. Um, and on top of Winter Hill, there's um, there's a TV mast which um, sends out the the old uh, TV signals before we used to. <laughs> Yeah, it is still there and it still works. It it, it now serves the um, the Freeview channels on oh. on TV. So you know we've all got satellite dishes now and cable and everything yeah. else. But but people who have Freeview, the signal still comes from Winter Hill. So it's very high up and it's it's a big radio mast and it, it you know it sends out these these radio signals. Now. Again, I was doing some doing some research into into local UFOs, and I came across this particular story, and it's from November 1999, and um, it was investigated by a local UFO investigator. Now, before I tell you the story, I'll, I'll just I'll just explain that I did actually find this gentleman um, on social media, and I, I emailed him to ask him about this incident, and he didn't reply. So I'll only refer to him by his first name, which is Steve. Um, okay. okay, because you know he didn't he didn't reply to me, um, but this was this actually happened in 1999, and it was Saturday the 13th of November, and he he made a, um, a report of what happened and and put it online. Um, now it's what's it, it's become known as as as, as what now what's called the Murphy incident, and it's because uh, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Murphy was was involved. He was the one that that reported the incident, and he um, was working on a farm which was situated up near Winter Hill, um, and it was a cattle farm, and he he was. Um, he'd been born in Ireland, um, so he had a very strong Irish accent, which is important uh, when we go through the story. But he was he was a cattle hand, in effect. He, he worked on the farm, looked after the livestock, in particular looked after the cattle. Um, and he'd worked there for, he said, probably about 15 years um, when this incident happened. Now, um, Steve received a, a telephone call on this particular Saturday afternoon from... Uh, this this guy called Stuart Murphy. Now, Mr. Murphy had uh, initially rung uh, Greater Manchester Police, and he was in a very high state of agitation. And because of his strong Irish accent, um, the police officer on the other end of the line was really struggling understanding what he was saying. But he he was picking up the words UFO and and, and aliens and and cattle and all all these sort of words. So. The the police knew of, of Steve, who was a local investigator. They had his telephone number. So, and so they passed his number on to Mr Murphy and said, why don't you give this gentleman a ring? He'll be able to investigate it for you. You know, the police thinking that, that Mr Murphy was a bit of a nut job. Um, so basically, Mr Murphy said that he, he was out in, in the field quite close to the to the farmhouse um, this particular Saturday afternoon, and he was out trying to get the uh, the cattle back into the into the barn. And he said, all of a sudden, there was um, there was a bright light appeared above him and above the the field, very low, with a um, a very loud droning noise um but he said it, 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 it wasn't an aircraft it wasn't a helicopter um it there was no um suggestion to him that that it was anything man-made it was just this extremely bright light with this very very loud droning noise and, and the noise he said he hadn't heard before he, he couldn't he couldn't explain what it sounded like it didn't sound like an aircraft or a helicopter um 
and he said his cattle scattered. They all started running about, you know, all some went one way, some went the other. Obviously, in a in a state of panic. And of course, at this point, he began to panic, um, and he, he he turned and, and started running back towards uh, the farmhouse. <clears throat> got into the farmhouse, slammed the door behind him, and, of course, you know, very, very gingerly looked out of the window. Um, and he said he could see this object had followed him down the field to where the farmhouse was. And then when he went into the farmhouse, he could see it was moving back away again, back up towards the field, and, and resumed its um, its position over the, over the cattle. So he immediately rang Greater Manchester Police, so I said really didn't take him seriously. Um, but... After he after he um, spoken to um, to the police, um, he, he he said that shortly afterwards and, and shortly after he'd sp- he'd spoken to Steve, um, because he, he he had two telephone conversations with Steve. So in between the two telephone conversations, he said that um, the farm had been visited by what he described as um, as three suited gentlemen. Um, who claimed to be from the the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food. Um, And he said that the the only way that he could describe them, um, and he said they looked like that film, uh, The Men in Black. Um, And he said, you know, I I know it sounds ridiculous, but but that's that's what they look like. Um, Now, apparently, they they were really interested um, in in what had happened. Um, and Miss uh, uh, Steve decided that that he needed to go up to the farm um, and have a look and, and and have a look at the area and, and try and uh, try and speak to Mister Murphy sort of face to face. So um, Steve set off in his in his car the following week. Uh, following weekend, he had a rough idea where the farm was from the description that that Mr. Murphy had given him, and he was driving up over the moors. And um, he decided to, to to pull over and 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 check his map. Um, you know, the old fashioned map. There was no no GPS or um, anything like that at the time, and he, he he said that he pulled into a a car park, small car park on the side of the road, um, and he noticed that um, a, a Land Rover pulled up behind him, and he said that a man got out uh, dressed in what he described as, as as just normal jeans, a jumper, and a, and a flat cap, and he said he was aged probably about mid mid thirties. Um, and at, at this point, Steve had got out of the car and, and this, this guy walked up to him and, and started talking to him and, and he asked him where he was going. Now, Steve obviously thought this was strange for a start off and he was he was quite um, sort of taken aback by this and, and, you know, maybe not even a little bit sort of worried about what this, this particular guy was up to. Um, so Steve said that he, he was just out looking for um, a farm that his friend worked at. Um, and, and you know he was just checking his map so this this guy said okay fair enough got back in his jeep and drove off <laughs> anyway um short while after um steve managed to find this farm um you know he, he knew the name of the farm and he sort of asked mm. around um a few people uh the side of the road when he was driving along or what have you and, and he managed to find this this farm um, now the interesting thing is that when he found the farm, he he drove up to the to the to the uh, to the farm track, and he could see the farmhouse not not too far away. And he said he got out of the car to have a look, and as he was walking up the uh, the farm track, he could see a, a field behind the farm, and he could see that there was a large circular burnt patch in the field. And, and there were still there were cows in the field, he said, but but they were all sort of none of them were stood on this this burnt patch. He said they were all around it. It was it was quite quite a strange sight. And as he was walking up up the farm track, he said the there was a, a guy walking down towards him who was obviously well. He introduced himself as the owner of the farm. Um, and Steve said, you know, I've come to see um, Mr. Murphy, and the um, the the, the the farm owner said, I have no idea who Mr. Murphy is. 
And Steve said, well, you know, he told me he'd worked here for 15 years as one of your farm hands. Um, and he said, no, I've got absolutely no idea who he is. And can, can, you, can you please leave? So as Steve turned to, to walk back down the farm track, um, lo and behold, the, uh, the Land Rover uh, comes down the road and stops at the bottom of the farm track um, with two uh, large black blacked-out windows, Range Rovers. Um, and the guy that he, he'd met earlier on in the day with the jeans and the flat cap got out of the, uh, the Land Rover and then out of the two... Um, blacked out Land Rovers um, stepped suited gentleman with sunglasses on one was carrying a briefcase um, looked very very official um, and one of them walked up to Steve as he was walking back towards his car um, and asked him what he was doing and he said well I've just you know come to meet a friend who's not here um, and he said that, that they, they were you know, really interested in who he was. They were making a note of his uh, registration number of his car, uh, where he'd been, who he'd been speaking to. Um, and Steve, you know, recorded in his report that at this point he thought, um, you know, I'm off, I'm out of here. I don't like this. This is this is this is scary. There's something not right about these these guys. Um, jumped back in his in his car and, and drove off and as he looked in the rearview mirror they were they were still stood there and, and they were talking to the to the farmer and, and sort of he said he could see there was a lot of gesticulation going on between between them um, and then he sort of disappeared around the corner and drove off and he, he, he tried to make some further inquiries as to what had been going on. He managed to find out actually that um, that Mr Murphy had decided that um, himself and his family, his wife and his children, um, should leave and go back to live in Ireland for whatever reason. Um, and, and, and he just sort of, every, every time he tried to make uh, any further inroads into what had happened, he just kept hitting dead ends. So, um, so that, that, was a, that was an interesting story. And that, that of course, is the classic uh, men, in men, black. In, men in Black story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Which is interesting because we, I mentioned um, earlier on yeah. um, about Hebden Bridge and Todmorden. Mm. Now, at the minute, I haven't actually spoken to uh, the lady involved, but uh, a couple of months ago there was um, a, an animal mutilation, a, a, a cow cattle um, mutilation found uh, in a field uh, in Todmorden. And um, it was found by one of the local farmers, and I've seen photographs. She's uh, the the lady who was investigating is a lo local investigator who I um, I believe you know called Debbie Hatswell. Yeah, yeah, we know. we know Debbie. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've spoken to Debbie by email, and I'm actually going to give her a, a call tomorrow because this is um, again this is a fascinating local story, very local to to me. Um, well, she sent me photographs of the um, the carcass that was found. Um, they obviously photographed it, you know, fairly fairly quickly after mm. finding it. And it's there's the surgical precision um, uh, lacerations and cuts uh, on this animal, which again is something which is um, you know happens quite a lot with these. Um, yeah, they're drains of blood, aren't they? they found. Yeah, and and things like they remove. I mean, it's quite grisly, but but they remove the ears, the ears, um, but but in a surgical manner. This this one had parts of its face removed and its eyes removed, but oh. in a circular manner, not in the way that mm. um, you know a dog would 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 attack a corpse or, uh, or a dead animal, or you know crows would would take the eyes out or whatever. It was it was done in a very surgical. Uh, a very surgical way. Yeah, it's a very, but, very precision cuts and things yeah. like that. Well, but interestingly, she she told me that she told me in the email that I, I received this afternoon. She said that um, there've been a number of other um, animal bodies found in the area since this first one had been found a, a couple of months ago. Um, but there have been reports of. Um, uh, men from various government ministries um, being seen in and around the area uh, making 
um, enquiries with local people, local farmers, um, and, and they can't identify where the original. Um, it was actually a calf. It was only a young, young cow. Um, they can't actually identify. None of the local farmers say that it's 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 their cow, their calf. Um, so they can't identify which which farm it came from. So whether it was picked up from somewhere else and and dropped there is a is a question really that, that that you have to ask. You know. So so that's an ongoing investigation. But again, there's been the you know the men in black have been involved in this one, and it, it just seems quite strange that these these people turn up at uh, you know when when these instances occur. Yeah, it is. They just come out of the blue. And you know the the strange thing about the Men in Black, if you really start looking into the history and lore of it, I mean, uh, our friend Nick Redfern, who's written several books on the Men in Black, and even uh, Richard Keel, who uh, in his famous book The Mothman Prophecies talks about the Men in Black, and it seems like you know in, in the past people seem to think they're part of the government just trying to harass people and shut them up but there's a lot of high strangeness surrounding them the fact that they're wearing the fedora hats the suits and the driving the cars that are like 40 50 years old too old um way out of date and sometimes they act unfamiliar with uh with certain things like uh, Richard Keel mentioned in the Mothman prophecies, how one man in black, he went to the local newspaper and he was asking some questions and he picked up a ballpoint pen and he was looking at it and playing with it like he'd never seen one before. Uh Um, Some people have claimed that they've had encounters with men in black where it looks like they're wearing makeup because their skin is actually very, very pale uh, underneath and it was showing I mean they like they're not exactly human um, just a lot of strangeness surrounding the yeah. whole phenomenon you know they come I, in I, th- I think the ones that we get over here now they're driving more driving more modern cars mm. there but um, yeah, yeah this... there's, uh, there's always that strange feeling isn't there mark with them Mm. You know? Yeah, they just have a habit of, of You get a gut feeling that something's not right. Yep. They scare people, they you know, they try to intimidate them into silence. Um and they show up at the strangest times. You can have a sighting. Nobody else in the world will know you're there having and having a sighting and yet they'll still know and show up. And what is the purpose behind that, you know? It all sounds very, uh, very Project Blue Book, doesn't it? It's it's almost as if if the the sort of from fifty years ago, you know, um, you know the 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 way that as, as you say, Mark, the way that they dress and and the the vehicles that they drive, it's almost it's almost as if they're out of time, isn't it? It, it's yeah. like it's like they've done some. They've looked at some old TV shows of Earth and say, okay, and you know, they watch the old <laughs> yeah. ones. They've been watching the black and white movies. Yeah, and that's how they decide uh, how government people would dress. Um, yeah, you know the the Men in Black also seem to have a lot in common with the other phenomenon that's been going around uh, here for like almost the last twenty years is the uh the black eyed children phenomenon. Okay. There's there's a lot that's very similar to that in that these pale black eyed kids show up on somebody's doorstep and they give off this vibe, this menace or fear as they beg you to let them in their house because they need to call their mother or some reason they want you to let them in. It's almost like the old vampire tales where, you know, you can't, vampires can't come in unless you invite them in. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's weird. So, people, you get any black eyed children, come to your house. Please, please don't let them in. <laughs> I could tell yeah. you a few people's houses to send them to. No, I don't have a phone, but that my next door neighbor's, he has one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> my my oh, pain, pain in the ass next door neighbor. Yeah. Definitely, I'd do that. I tell you, go <laughs> next door. He'll welcome you. 
Yeah, no, that is a, it is weird. It is weird, but they do show. Apparently, and there's been so many reports where they've shown up at sightings. Now, how many UFO sightings have you had yourself, Greg? Sorry, say that again, Mark. How many, how many UFO sightings have you had personally? Um, I've had a couple. Um, I had one when I was um, when I was much younger, when I was in um, in my late teens. Um, and when, when I was living, uh, I was still living at home with my parents, and there was a there was a very bright object um, that appeared, and it was hovering over the. We had um, a, a school quite close to where we lived at the the, the back of the house, um, and there was um, there was some sports fields, you know, like football football pitches or as you call them, soccer pitches, mm-hmm. um, and there was a, there was a very bright light appeared. Um, over the top of the the sports pitches um, one night, which was seen by uh, by myself and and by um, a few of of my neighbours, um, and it uh, again it wasn't um, it didn't seem to be uh, an aircraft or a helicopter or anything like. That. In fact, it was absolutely silent, but it was definitely hovering probably a couple of thousand feet above us. But it was a very very bright light. Um, and again, it, it just hovered there for probably only for a couple of minutes, but it seemed like an age and then just accelerated and shot away at speed again, you know, like, like so many, so many reports. Um, and it, it, that also made, uh, made the local newspaper um, shortly afterwards. And, 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 you know, so there was quite a lot of people saw it and, and reported it. So that was, well, that must be 30 years ago now when I, when I saw that, um, and, and then of course the other one was the one I, I described earlier. So, so I've only seen a couple, but but they've both been uh, strange enough to sort of um, you know lodge themselves in my memory, shall we say? Okay. Now, with the right. UFO sightings you've had, have you ever had you know what some people have experienced? Anything along the lines of missing time or any other feelings of high strangeness associated with it? Or was it just a plain old sighting? For me, they were just the plain old sightings. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't feel like there was any missing time or, or anything like that. But they were, they were just really strange, um, strange, strange objects in the sky that, that were behaving in, in a way that, that you wouldn't expect a, a man-made object to behave. Now, you know, along with UFO activity, you know, we've talked about UFOs, we've talked about ley lines, but then we also, you know, as we're coming into the last part of the show, we can just talk a bit about some ghost stories, regular paranormal yes. stories. Got to get the ghost is in. And, and you had one in particular that you wanted to talk about, the Grindleton uh, Bridge Ghost? Yeah, this is this is this is a fascinating one, and in fact, this is um, this is an example of of a of a story that that you hear, um, or as an investigator, you know, as a paranormal investigator, people people tell you stories all the time about you know various ghost sightings or ghostly things that have happened to them, and then you start to do some research and you start to do a little bit of digging and all of a sudden everything falls into place. It's almost like a jigsaw, and then all of a sudden the story takes on. Um, almost a life of its own. This particular one, um, very close to to the village, is um, as I mentioned before. There's the there's the River Ribble, um, and there is a there's now it's a road bridge, um, a stone road bridge which crosses uh, crosses the river, and, and it's known locally as Grindleton Bridge. Grindleton is a is a village which is on the other side of of the river. And where the bridge is now, it's an area which is um, unfortunately uh, li- liable to, to flooding. So when, when we get very heavy rainfalls in the winter, it's an area which, of, of the river which um, often bursts its banks. And in fact, um, the bridge has, even the stone bridge has been uh, submerged underwater um, many times and, and, you know, vehicles can't can't pass over it. So... Um, there's, there's, it's an area that, that is, is, is well known for flooding and has been for probably for hundreds of years. Um, I was talking to uh, a friend of uh, mine in, in, in the village and he was telling me a story about um, his uncle who um, quite a few years ago now, probably 30, 40 years ago, um, was down 
uh, on the river very early one morning, uh, fishing down near where the uh, the bridge is at, uh, at you know the Grindleton Bridge, um, and on the opposite side of of the uh, the bridge on on the other bank to um, to to my side as it were the village side where I live um, there was a um, a cotton mill uh, which has now been there, there are still some of the um, some of the buildings are still there, but they've been turned into sort of, um, you know, houses and, and residential uh, properties and and some sort of like little business units and, and that sort of thing. But but some of the um, the building of, of of the cotton mill is there, and and this cotton mill goes back to sort of mid eighteen eighteen uh, fifties, maybe even it maybe even before that. So this guy was was down on the river very early one morning fishing, and he was fishing in a spot uh, just slightly downstream of of where the uh, the stone bridge is. Now, anyway, he, he he was he was looking across the fields behind him, and he noticed that there was um, there was a young woman walking across the fields towards him, um, and and he, he sort of described her as as having a long flowing um, white dress on. And she was holding hands with um, a little girl who was dressed in a in a similar fashion, long flowing white dress. And they were both walking across the field uh, towards him. And he immediately thought it was strange because, um, first of all, it was very early in the morning. It was about five thirty in the morning. It was summer, so it was it was coming light. Um, but he also knew that there was no footpath across the field. Uh, and so he, he thought it was quite strange that, that he would see these these two people walking, you know, in that direction towards the river. Anyway, as as they got closer, he carried on fishing and he sort of looked up and, and he thought, you know, it's only polite to say good morning. So he, he said good morning to them. They weren't more than probably about 10 yards away from him at this point. Um, and he said good morning and he said it's a bit early to be out you know and and they just ignored him and carried on walking towards the um the river bank and then he said to his absolute shock they walked off the river bank and continued walking in thin air across the river and disappeared into the bank on the other side so of course, immediately he packed all his fishing gear up and and left <laughs> because he was he was quite shocked by what he'd just seen. He he realised that you know he he'd seen some sort of um, some sort of ghost. So I started looking um, in local records to see if there's anything I could find, to see if there was any other uh, reports of a of a similar phenomenon. And and what I did find was that the stone road bridge that's there now was built in uh, was built in 1930 and prior to the stone road bridge being built there was um, there was a wooden footbridge which used to used to span the river used to cross the river and it was um, just downstream of where the, the the current stone bridge is now and I know that because I found uh, a photograph. It's an old black and white photograph. And it's taken from about 1928, 1929. You can see the um, the beginnings of the stone footbridge on the... Sorry, the stone road bridge on the right-hand side of the picture. But you can also see in the middle of the picture there is um, uh, a wooden footbridge and part of it has been washed away so that there'd obviously been a flood when the photograph was taken um and, and it had washed away part of this this uh, this wooden footbridge um and going back into the records um it would seem that this this wooden footbridge had been there for for quite a long time it was the only way obviously that, that they could cross cross the river from one bank to the other um and that just you know before they built the wooden footbridge, there was in fact a, a rowing boat, a sort of ferry service, if you like, a local local rowing boat um, that used to take people from one side of the river to the other and back again. Uh, but the interesting thing is that that where this um, this sighting had been made was where the footbridge used to be. So. The, the the ghosts of, of this woman and this little girl were actually crossing over the river, even though they were seen, you know, going across in thin air, as it were. 
um, yeah. they were in fact crossing over the river where, where the, the wooden footbridge used to be. Uh, so I found energy. residual energy, yeah, or, or a, a replay or a recording yeah. um, or something like that. So, yeah, that's, um, you know, um, um, uh, and when you do the research and you find these things and, and, and you find a photograph of what it looked like with the old footbridge and you can see, you know, where, where, the, where the bridge is now, where they were building it, where the footbridge is, you, you, know, you can sort of see exactly where these figures were seen crossing the river and, and they were obviously following the, the path of the old, the old wooden footbridge across to to where the mill is on the other side which would explain why they were wearing these these sort of like long white flowing dresses um you know they were obviously crossing the river to go across to the, to work in the mill yeah uh, that's interesting very so, interesting was there any others sorry mark did you say anything something mark? well no no i mean that that is very interesting I mean, you're in England. There's ghosts everywhere. <laughs> you, can't, you can't put your arm out without touching one. No, there does, yeah, does seem to be. Um, I was I was told another story. Um, uh, we have two uh, two pubs in the village. Um, two, oh, you're two, lucky. <laughs> I know, I know. And, and well, they're both open at the minute, but the way things are going, they, they may not be in the future. Um, but I was. I was Again, I was talking to a uh, to a guy from the village, and um, he 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 told me this this story about he was he was in one of the pubs uh, one 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 evening, and a friend of his came in. Now his friend had quite a a walk of about he lived in he lives in the next village along, so he walks about two miles something like that from where he lives into our village to 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 meet his friend and have a drink in the pub and then he walks back again. Um, so he said this particular evening it was it was the middle of winter actually he said it was quite quite you know quite nasty weather outside raining and what have you. Um, anyway he said he he came in and he 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 said his friend looked really. Um, as as he put it, really flustered. You know, he said he he, he looked really shaken up. Um, and he said to him, "What what's wrong?" You know, apart from the fact he was absolutely drenched, wet through. Um, and he said, "Well, I've just had a really strange experience." He said, "I was I was walking down the road, and, and bearing in mind that the road from the village where he lives to uh, into the centre of the village where where I am, um, it's quite a long, dark country country road. There's not a lot of street lighting. It's you know, it's almost." pitch black in the middle of winter so it's not a particularly nice uh, nice road to walk down it's out in the middle of the countryside um so he, he said i've had this really strange experience he said i was walking down it's called solely road so i was walking down so coming down solely road and he said i was absolutely convinced there was somebody following me and he said all the way from from the main, the main road, the main A fifty nine road. He said all all the way down Solly Road. He said I kept turning round and looking and stopping, and he said he said there was definitely somebody following me. He said there was there was somebody almost breathing down my neck. He said it was really really strange, and the guy I was talking to said he, he was shaking. He said he could see he was physically shaking, and as he as he paid for his for his pint, you know, he got his pint. And he said he, he could physically see his pint in his hand was shaking as he was drinking, and there was a lady stood close by at the bar and she'd obviously heard this story and she just leaned over and and, and she said to the guy who'd, who'd come into the pub she said um where's your dog and he and he looked at her and he said i don't have a dog and she said well a dog came in with you and sat sat by your feet when you came to the bar where was it gone and he said i haven't got a dog i've never had a dog <laughs> Oh my gosh. So, you know, Whoa. had he been had he been followed by the dog? <laughs> yeah, so dog Very obviously strange. took there yeah, this this spectral dog obviously took a liking to him. But you know something, you're talking about footsteps behind you. The amount of times that I've been walking at night on my own and I've heard footsteps behind me. But there's never been anyone there. Mm-hmm. You know, it gets so frightening. Sometimes you feel like bolting it down the road, sort of thing. 
running yeah, to you, is, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's quite. It is. It, it is quite scary. The interesting thing about that story, though, and 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 actually, the the guy that I was talking to, he sort of he 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 told me that story as a sort of add-on mm. to the to the main story that he was telling me. And this this particular road that that his friend was walking down, on this road there are some um, allotments, um, and and in fact, I rent one of the allotments and, you know, grow a bit of veg and fruit and have a greenhouse and a polytunnel and all that on it. But so I know that it's, it's at night, it's absolutely pitch black. Mm. Um, and, you know, the guy that, that came into the pub with the ghostly dog will have, will have walked past, uh, past these allotments. Um, but the other gentleman I was speaking to was the one that was, that was telling me the story. He, he said to me, he said, I don't like being down here at night or when it's going dark, he said, because about about eight to nine years ago, he said I was I was down here just um, locking locking on stuff. He used to uh, he used to to own, to have some uh, some chickens down there, so he used to have to go down morning and, and night to sort of you know feed the chickens and then um, lock them up and make sure that they were all safely away. Um, mm. And he said I, he said I was down one one night. He said and he said there was this. He said it was almost like this black blob suddenly appeared by the gate, the main gate onto the allotment site. And he said, I could see it, uh, you know, as, 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 as plain as anything. And he said it was it was almost, he, he described it to me as being sort of um, waist height um, and, and, and sort of like almost like, like a square. He said it was it was as wide as it was as you know it was as tall, but it but he said it was almost like he had a he had a consciousness. He said it was moving towards me, and he said I could feel like it it, it knew that I was there, and he said it then sort of moved away to my left, and he he, he was pointing and showing me you know because we were actually on the on the allotments when he was telling me this particular story, and he was pointing and showing me which which, which gate it was moving towards, and then he said suddenly it shot past me. It came back towards me and shot past me. He said, and it disappeared off into into the field up at the side there. And he said, I absolutely, he said, I was absolutely terrified. He said, it was horrible. He said, it was a really, really horrible feeling. And he said, I know that there's other people that I've spoken to who, who you know, have allotments down here, rent allotments. He yeah. said, there's quite a, quite a few people don't like being down here at night. He said, because you know there's 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 this there is something down there which is which is really quite unpleasant so it's interesting that the guy in the pub with the ghostly dog will have had to have walked past that particular place yeah um and it, it you know you you sort of wonder whether he, he sort of picked something up with him as he was going along or or you know whether it was something totally um totally different mm. do you have allotments there mark um, not sure. There's a little patch of ground that you can rent to grow your vegetables on. Uh, not that I'm aware of. No, uh, well, that's I, that's why I'm explaining it for the listeners out in America. Um, yeah, I think it's a it's a peculiar sort of um, yeah British you know, thing, isn't it? It's yeah, a British, it's a British thing. thing. It's like some someone's got a spare field or something. They would cut it up into sections. You'd rent a section. You can go there, put your little um, tool shed on there for your garden stuff or your greenhouse, and grow your vegetables. They're lovely there. Hmm. Hmm. But, but this one seems to have something attached to it, <laughs> which is which is quite odd here. Yeah. You, you know, in black masses, it's hard to tell what they are. You know, really, that they are what they are. Black mass. I mean, is it? Are you dealing with something spiritual? Are you dealing with something possibly interdimensional? You know, who knows? Or, yeah, it's di- difficult to tell. Yeah. Mm. Now, who knows? You're. Your father saw a couple of ghosts, did he? Yeah, he did. Um, and in fact, I've I, I never told anybody about this until actually um, I was writing the book, um, and, and and I thought, well, you know, he told me two stories that, that were really quite quite incredible um and and my dad was was something my, my dad passed away um quite a few years ago now 1998 but he wasn't the sort of person to um to make 
put stories like this. He was, you know, he 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 wasn't um, he wasn't somebody that used to tell tall stories. He he mentioned to me on only once actually that that you know he did have these these two experiences. One one was um, my maternal grandfather's funeral. Um, and, uh, and it was actually after the funeral service, and we were um, we'd all gone back to my uh, to my grand grandmother's house, um, you know, as as you do for for the wake. I don't know whether you, I, I, I assume you have, you know, similar things, um, you know, when when you have funerals in in America, um, you know, you all get together and, and you have a you have a few drinks and, and you you sort of remember <laughs> the person who's um, who's passed away. Um but my dad said that he um he was stood in the um the lounge, the living room um area of, of my grandma's house and um he said he saw my granddad sat in his favourite chair. Um, and he was, um, he said he, he he was just staring past him as if he was looking out the window. Um, he said he had a smile on his face, um, and he he said he, he saw him for you know a few seconds, and then he he just faded and disappeared. Um, and he said that that quite changed the way that he looked. at at the world in general, really, because I don't think my dad believed in in ghosts. I don't think he believed in in anything uh, spiritual um, up until that point. But he said, you know, he said I I saw I saw Bill as he was called uh, uh, sat there looking looking out through the window, smiling. Um, he seemed very content, and he said he just um, faded away before before my eyes. And he said I, you know. I, I'm convinced that the, what I saw was real. Yeah. yeah I was uh, in a friend's house once. I don't, know, I don't think I've told you this, Mark. I was in a friend's house once, sitting there drinking coffee and one thing or another. Uh, it was a girls' get-together in there. And we were drinking tea and coffee, by the way. And sitting opposite me there was french doors and i looked out the french doors up to a garden there was an old potting shed there was a little old man potting around up there with his plants doing stuff up at the top of the garden and i said to her i said i thought because this was a young family with two small children i said you've got your father living with you now and she said no i said well i said who's the old man out in the garden and she said oh she said that's been seen before, she said. The neighbour says it's the old man that used to live here. So, and I saw well, him as clear as a bell. Well, it's that is that's strange that because the other the other one that my dad told me about was um, was shortly after we'd we'd moved and well they'd moved into the in, mm. in, in, into a new house and the house had previously been occupied by um, an elderly lady who had um, had to go into to care and, and then had, had passed away. And um, my dad said that, that, that he saw an old lady walking past the window um, in the in the living room. Um, and, and the way that the um, the house was was laid out with, with the back garden and everything else, there was only one way in and one way out. Um, <clears throat> and he, he said that, that the... The old lady walked past the window, and he went. My dad went out of the, of the back way of the house to sort of come round the back of the house to meet her um, face on, if you like. Uh, yeah. And he and he said um, she just wasn't there. Yeah. And he said there was. He said there was no way that that she could have turned round and gone out of the garden. You know, in the time that he'd gone round, he he, he said there was just just no way. And 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 he actually said I ran round the front of the house to look up and down the road to see if she was there, and he said she wasn't. But it's strange because I often felt that there was something in that house. Um, you know, some some um, other um, resident ent- <laughs> entity. Con- yeah, consciousness entity. Resident. Um, resident. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I never saw anything, but but I but I definitely felt that there was something there, 
Um, and, and it was only, you know, quite a few years later that, that my dad told me the story. So, so that sort of um, that sort of, you know, made me think that perhaps I've been picking up on things that, that that were definitely there. But the interesting thing about about that is similar story to that. Um, my son's thirteen now, James. Um, but when yeah. he was um, when he was a, a baby, he was less less than twelve months old. Um, it's it's quite a sad story in, in in a way. This one of one of our friends, one of our very good friends, uh, a guy called Dave. Um, he was only forty, uh, unfortunately. He, he developed bowel cancer and died. Um, and he was one of James's uh, godfathers. Um, and um, Shortly after he'd passed away and, and the fun- funeral had taken place and everything else, we um, we went round to see his widow, who was, you know, obviously a good friend of, uh, of ours. Um, and we were in the house, and, and James, as I say, was a baby, and he was, he was really tired. He was really, really crabby. Um, and my wife, Sarah, said to... Um, said to to Alison, who was the, the lady's house we're at, girl's mm-hmm. house we're at. Um, she said, is it okay if I just put him on your bed and just, you know, try and just get him to, to settle down and, and go to sleep? And she said, yeah, no problem. So Sarah took him into the into the bedroom. Anyway, about 10 minutes later, she came out and she looked quite sort of, something had happened. I could tell something had happened. And I said to her, is, is James okay? And she said, yeah, yeah, he's absolutely fine. And she kept looking at me quite strange. And I thought, what have I done wrong? You know, I thought there was something, <laughs> I, thought I, I thought I was in trouble for something. And it was only afterwards when we got back in the car, James, James had fallen asleep and we, you know, we, we got him up and took him mm. in the car and everything when we were going to put him in his car seat and he was, he was fine. And as, as we were driving away and we were sort of waving to, to Alison and we, we got, got on the road and set off. So I was, and I said to her, I said, are you okay? And she said, no. She said, something really, really strange happened when I, when I put, him, put him down on the bed. She said, I, I laid him on his back and, and took his, took his um, he had like a little sort of jumper on and he had a, um, a baby grow underneath, you know, like a little vest and, yeah. and what have you. <clears throat> and she said, I was just taking it off. She said, and all of a sudden, she said, the outline of a hand appeared under his, uh, under his vest and it started making a circular motion like it was rubbing his chest. And she said, I just sat there and looked at it. And she said, I didn't feel scared. She said, because I knew it was Dave. And Dave was the guy that had passed away. And she mm. said, I knew it, I knew it was him. And and she said, it, it, it's, you know, they sort of met about half a dozen sort of like little circular motions. And then the outline of the hand just, just faded, just disappeared. And, and the baby she said, settled down. And he was fine. Just, just fell asleep. <laughs> which oh, you know from nice. experience of, of what he was when he was a baby he never fell asleep that fast when i used to stroke his tummy <laughs> so um so yeah that was um again you know i think that's i think when when sometimes when people pass away i don't mm. think they always move on i think sometimes they come back and they maybe say bye to people in their own way you know i think that's what my granddad was doing he was there at, after his funeral Making sure that everybody was okay, making sure that my my grandma was okay, yeah. um, and then he, he felt he could move on. Um, and again, I think you know the um, thing that happened with with James and 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 the hand and everything else. I think was maybe just you know Dave's way of, of saying I'm here and you know I'm I'm moving on sort of thing. So so that was. That was quite touching, but also a little bit scary. Yeah, no, I think I think that's nice. Did you ever tell his wife later uh, on? No. No. No, we didn't. Simply because I think um, you know I I, I I discussed it with Sarah, and I think we both decided that it was probably better not to because we didn't think that she would. Um, Accept it that well. <laughs> maybe, maybe accept it in the same way that we had. No. Mm. No, that, that is very nice. Don't you think so, Mark? Yes. Mm. Yes, very much. Well, you know what? We have uh, come at to the end of the show here. 
So um, that's gone quick. It's gone very quickly. Yes. Yeah, so uh, we've been talking with Craig Bryant, author of The Shadow Man of Accrington, Haunting Stories of the Paranormal and the Unexplained in Lancashire. Uh, now, uh, Craig, where can people find your book? Uh, well, it's on Amazon. Um, so if, if if they look for Craig Bryant uh, on Amazon, it's available uh, in various different countries through Amazon. Um, so in, in the UK, in, in the US, uh, across Europe and so on. Um, I've also got a website, which is uh, craigbryant.co.uk. Um, there's a link to the book on there. And there's also... Um, some of the stories that, that we've talked about tonight, there's, there's some of the photographs on there um, and, and some links to, to various other things as well. Fantastic. Well, Craig, thank you again for coming on the show tonight. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Um, thank, thanks for having me on. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. And don't forget, if you want to show with us on a radio station, just uh, contact us at info, I-N-F-O, at Parrot, oh, forgot it. P-A-U-K dot com. P-A-U-K radio dot com, yes. And, and for those of you, if you're listening to our live streaming uh, on our network, uh, you can also catch all of our podcasts. We are now available on iHeartRadio, uh, uh, Spreaker, um, Apple Podcasts and Amazon Podcasts and Google Podcasts. So you can literally find us now where, Irene? Everywhere, folks. Just everywhere. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> thank you again. And uh, we thank are you. going to be back next week with a brand new episode of the Paranormal UK Radio Show here on the Paranormal that? UK Radio Network. Uh, so, we what's that? Who we got next week? Uh, I have to look up the calendar. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> all right then. <laughs> all right, everyone, have a great weekend. We will uh, see you then. Take care. Now. Okay. Bye. Bye.